John Paul Jones, the naval captain, the war hero, the pirate, the badass. We've got a badass over here. And the musician. Well, he wasn't a musician. That's a different John Paul Jones. John Paul Jones was a Scottish-American naval captain in the Revolutionary War, and even referred to as the father of the American Navy. This title has been given to other nominal figures in American history, like John Barry, John Adams, and Joshua Humphrey. John was often accused of piracy by his enemies because of his tactics, and just how crazy of a man he was. So let us start at the beginning when John was only a kid. John Paul was born in Arbrigland, Scotland. You can even visit his birthplace and the house he lived in today. John Paul first started his maritime career at the ripe age of 13, which is pretty crazy to think about because when I was 13, I was jacking off and playing video games every day. So, Paul would sail on many ships until 1766, when he would sail on the two friends as a first mate and then abandon his position while docked in Jamaica. He would eventually obtain another position on the Brig John, which sailed from port in 1768. While the Brig John was sailing, both the captain and a ranking mate suddenly died of yellow fever. Paul would navigate the ship back to a safe port. The owners of the ship were indebted and made Paul the master of the ship and crew. Paul would go on two voyages to the West Indies with the ship and crew until 1770, when John would have one of his crew flogged after trying to start a mutiny about wages. The sailor would die two weeks later and tarnish all of the reputation John Paul had built for himself. This would lead John Paul to flee to Fredericksburg, Virginia and change his surname to Jones. On a side note, there is a long-held tradition in the state of North Carolina that John chose the name Jones in honor of Willie Jones. Willie Jones was a delegate to the Continental Congress. In the summer of 1775, Jones met Joseph Hughes and other revolutionary leaders in Philadelphia. It was not long after this that John Paul Jones would join the American Navy. With the help of many members of the Continental Congress, Jones managed to be appointed as a first lieutenant of the USS Alfred in the Continental Navy on December 7, 1775. Jones would sail on the USS Alfred to the Bahamas to raid Nassau for military supplies. Later, Congress would order the construction of 13 frigates for the American Navy, and Jones would be assigned as a captain of the USS Providence in the summer of 1776. As the commander of Providence, Jones would provide a wide range of service services for the Continental Congress such as the transport of troops, the movement of supplies, and the escort of convoys. One day, while performing one of these services, Jones was able to assist a brig from Hispaniola that was being chased by the HMS Cerberus, a British Royal Navy ship. The brig from Hispaniola would then be purchased by Congress and put in commission as the USS Hapton. After all of this, John would step up his game and head to Canso for an attack. John would destroy 15 vessels then pillage the communities of Petit de Gras, Arisha, and Nova Scotia. While doing all of this, he would recruit men to fill the ships he would capture. John would then carry out another mission, a mission to liberate hundreds of American prisoners forced to labor in coal mines in Nova Scotia and raid British shipping. But due to heavy winter conditions, John was prevented from freeing the prisoners, except John wasn't going to leave on a loss. So while John was sailing, he came across the Mellish, a vessel carrying a vital supply of winter clothing intended for General John Burgoyne's troops in Canada. John would capture the Mellish to prevent the cargo from being delivered. Now John was having a lot of success at sea, which would make you think he would be in high favor with those in authority. Well, he wasn't. See, John disagreed with a lot of people, especially with Commodore Hopkins. John believed that Hopkins was hindering his advancement by going against his campaign plans. The result of the feud placed Jones with a smaller command on the USS Ranger. John would sail to France in 1777 with orders to assist the American cause, however possible with the help of Benjamin Franklin, Silas Dean, and Arthur Lee. They would all promise the command of Indian, a vessel being constructed for America by the Netherlands in Amsterdam. The ship would inevitably be sold to France instead, which was still not an ally to America. This would lead to Jones once again, be left without a command. John would stay in France and form a close friendship with Franklin. On February 6, 1778, France would sign the Treaty of Alliance with America, and only eight days later, John and his ranger would become the first American naval vessel to be formally saluted by the French. John would write of the event, I accepted his offer all the more, for after all, it was a recognition of our independence and in the nation. And on April 10th, Jones would set sail for the western coast of Great Britain. 
Jones would have some successes against British merchant shipping in the Irish Sea, but then Jones would take his crew to participate in an assault on Whitehaven, which is the town where he first started sailing. Due to contrary wind and according to Jones, his senior officers had poor command qualities and that their objective was not to gain honor, but money. Jones decided to take the Ranger and his crew to Ireland. While causing havoc on the way, Jones learned that the HMS Drake, a Royal Navy sloop, was anchored off Carrick Fergus, Ireland. The Ranger would attack the HMS Drake just after midnight, but again, according to Jones, the man responsible for dropping the anchor was drunk and misjudged the timing, so they had to cut the anchor cable and run. But this wasn't the end of the HMS Drake and Jones. So now Jones decided to go back to Whitehaven to make another attempt at raiding. Jones' plan was to take two boats of 15 men in the middle of the night and set fire to and sink the 200 to 400 ships docked in the harbor, but ultimately, this plan would go to shit. The first problem arose during the journey to shore when they were slowed by the shifting wind and a strong ebb tide, and once they made it to shore they would successfully destroy the town's big defensive guns. The second problem began when some of the party were sent to raid a public house, but instead, they would stop and have a drink in the middle of the raid. Because of all the delays when they finally went to arson the ships, it was dawn, and this caused a civilian to slip away and alert the town, which in turn caused the fires to be put out and forced the Americans to retreat. Because the town defenses were destroyed, Jones and his crew were able to escape. Jones would then go to Scotland in hopes to hold for ransom Dunbar Douglas, 4th Earl of Selkirk who lived on St. Mary's Isle. When Jones and his men arrived on the island, the Earl appeared to be absent. In return, the Earl's wife entertained Jones and his men and even filled a large sack of coal and covered the top with silver to pay the Americans off. After this, Jones simply wanted to leave and continue wreaking havoc on the British, but his crew wanted to pillage, burn, and plunder the estate. Because of this, Jones had to settle and let the crew keep one silver plate adorned with the family's emblem. Later, when the plate was sold in France, Jones would buy the plate from the buyer and return it to the Earl of Selkirk after the war. After all of this, Jones was pondering on what to do next, and he thought, the Drake. So Jones and the Ranger headed back to Carrick Fergus. The Ranger would attack the Drake and this time capture the ship. In 1979, Jones would take command of the 42-gun USS Bonhomme Richard and assist a vast French and Spanish invasion fleet by providing a diversion by heading for Ireland. While en route to Ireland, Jones would come head-to-head -head with the more powerful English warship HMS Serapis. After three hours of gunfire, Jones would slam the Bonhomme into Serapis, strategically tying them together. The British would ask if Jones was ready to surrender, and he would famously respond, I have not yet begun to fight. Later, one of Jones' naval officers would toss a grenade onto Serapi and cause severe damage which would cause the British to surrender. This battle would make John Paul Jones famous, and within a year, King Louis XVI would honor Jones with the title Chevalier or Knighthood, and the Continental Congress would give him a medal made of gold for his valor and brilliant services. While in the meantime, Britain could only think of him as a pirate. By the end of the Revolutionary War in 1787, there was not much work left for John in America, so what did he do? That's right, he would enter the service of Empress Catherine, the second of Russia, and John was even granted a new name, Paul de Jones. Led by Prince Charles of nassau Segan. Jones would take part in a naval campaign in the Black Sea against the Turks. Jones and the prince would successfully repel the Ottoman forces from the area, but the prince was jealous of Jones and would turn a different prince, Prince Grigory Potemkin, against Jones. Although Jones would be awarded the Order of St. Anne, he would leave Russia the following month. In 1790, Jones would go to Paris, and with his Russian pension, he could retire, but only two years later he would die and be buried in Paris at the St. Louis Cemetery, which the location would eventually be lost. But even in death, that wasn't the end for John Paul Jones. In 1824, James Fenimore Cooper would write a novel named The Pilot, which was based on fictionalized accounts of Jones' maritime adventures, and later, in 1846, Alexandra Dumas, the author of The Three Musketeers and The Count of Monte Cristo, would write a follow-up novel titled Captain Paul. Moreover, in 1905, Jones' remains were found and identified by U.S. Ambassador Horace Porter.
Porter had been using copies of Joan's burial record, which read that a Frenchman, Pierrot Francois Simoneau, had donated over 460 francs to mummify the body, and quoted that, in the event that should the United States decide to claim his remains, they might more easily be identified. Well, that's about it, guys. I hope you enjoyed the video, and as always, thanks for watching. <laughs>